Bonjour Paris, comment ça va Comment ça va Ça va bien You know, the, the Jamaican word for ça va bien is airy. Pouvez-vous dire ça? Airy. Encore? Airy. Encore une fois. Airy. Oh, merveilleux. Awesome group oh, here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, they're awesome, but you speak French. Oh, I'm pro. I'm okay. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. so, I want to tell you also a story I'm sure you don't know. Um, do you remember this scene with uh, Sanka during Rasta Rocket? Do you remember it? Do you want to kiss my egg? Oh, Do you one. want to kiss my yeah. egg? J'ai adoré. J'adore cette conférence sur le bobsleigh à, à plein de niveaux. Euh, la première parce que il y a un travail d'équipe. C'est une équipe, ils sont deux sur scène, ça apporte une belle énergie. Je me souviens d'avoir euh, vu Rasta Rocket, le film Rasta Rocket qui m'a marqué. Et lorsque Hervé euh, m'a annoncé qu'il euh, serait là et qu'il venait de la Jamaïque, j'étais euh, wow, super excitée. Ils ont cette envie, cette motivation et c'est ça que j'ai retenu. In my mind, one of the fundamental differences between people who succeed immensely and those who don't, is their level of belief, their belief level. And in, in Rasta Rocket, the lucky egg, I believe, symbolizes your belief. Now, to be clear, none of us on the team in real life actually walked around with a lucky egg. That's a fabrication of Disney. But it's one that I like, because I think it, it makes really good sense, because in a way, all of us have our own lucky egg. Life is not a fairy tale. Things does not happen only because simply you believe, even if you try as hard as you can. And you know, you have to really believe in yourself and you have to put everything you have on it, even if sometimes you have a failure. Now, the thing that makes me chuckle when I see this is the fact that every single thing we're doing in this picture is wrong. And every kid will tell you the position of the hands, the elbows, the knees, the, it's all wrong. But that's what we thought we learned that weekend in Lake Placid with the American team. But here's a more important life lesson for, for every one of us. You should never, ever, ever wait until everything is perfect to go pursue your goals, to go after your dreams. Because the time will never be perfect. You have to start from where you are with what you have. C'était saupoudré d'humour. Euh, J'ai trouvé ça incroyable de penser que quelqu'un puisse faire du bobsled alors qu'ils n'ont jamais vu de la neige. It was dark and the first turn I saw was a chrysal, the biggest turn of the track, 360 degrees, 10 meters high. And then I hear the speaker from the track. Track is clear and then a bob was coming and I hear the sound of the bob getting louder and louder as it came down the track. He's coming, he's coming and then oh my god. You have to create a vision and what is vision? Vision is this compelling image that you have of what you want to create for yourself and the world around you. It's what I call a preferred future state. It's that which you aspire to achieve. And vision, you're correct, Devon. It's imagining your ideal future today and thinking about it, how it would look, how it would be, how you will feel when you will have achieving your goals. You can always elevate yourself to the next level. Yeah, and to elevate yourself to the next level, one of the fundamental key is your team. The word motivation, at, at least in English, is a contraction of the, the phrase motive for action. And so the question for you is, what is your motive for action? How many of you ever failed by show of hands and felt like a loser? Let me see the hands, keep them up, keep them up. How many of you have ever failed Keep them high and felt like a loser on international TV in front of millions of people. <laughs> Just me. 
Oh, yeah. Wow. <rires> well, I guess I should say merci bien. <rires> Euh, C'était aussi très émouvant, voilà, on peut échouer, on peut ne pas être choisi, mais à l'intérieur de soi, ce désir de faire et cette confiance, je sais que si je continue, je vais finir par faire. C'est un bel exemple de dire qu'on peut tous réussir, quoi qu'on fasse, quel que soit le domaine. Et comment on peut garder cette motivation à travers euh, les épreuves avec la consistance, la persistance. As I mentioned earlier, I was not chosen to compete in Albertville Olympic Games, and I was devastated. But I continue to believe in myself. Two years after, I also miss Olympic Game 94 in Lillehammer for a few points by my ranking, international ranking. But I never give up. I continue to believe in myself and to take persistent action And then finally, in 95, my teammate and I, and I matched together and we won a medal during the World Championship in two men. The more you persist, is the more you believe. And the more you believe, the more you persist. It creates this upward spiral. What was our result? It's not really important. Because more than a ranking, sport teaches lessons for life. All the lessons that I put in my lucky egg and created what I am today, what we are today. Inspiration, partage et joie. Ça faisait un bon duo. Voilà, ils se, ils se complétaient bien. Deux champions, c'était cool. <laughs> Eric and I, we had the good fortune and the honor to share the stage in Nagano. And now, the honor to share the stage here in Paris with you wonderful people. It's been awesome. And so, the only question I have for you now is, Where's your lucky egg? Who wants a lucky egg? Who wants a lucky egg? Who wants one? Thank you. Merci. Ready? Ready? Feel the rhythm. Feel the rhyme. Get on up. It's pamphlet time. Cool running. Well, this is an absolute shock in the making. Yesterday, they were falling down almost in the start. Now they slide into smoothly. Yesterday, their heads were bobbing everywhere. Today, they're almost in unison. through the Omega looking possessed here. It's not the same team we saw yesterday. Where did these guys come from? Jamaica! Well, they're real serious because he's got a lot of fear about this big four-man slide. He's all over the course right now. Watch, watch. I don't think his speed's important here. He just wants to get to the bottom. See all four, you see there, one in front of the sled, two more directly behind the sled and behind the official, one of the Olympic officials. The fourth man is there. We are happy to see that the bobsled team is okay. They did not make it across the finish line, so they will not be racing in the fourth heat. And after that crash, I don't blame them for watching the rest of it.
today I want to uh, share some thoughts with you on how you can keep on pushing during tough times, whether it's COVID or WebEx or whatever the tough times are, you can actually get through them. Um, so, you know, we we're talking earlier about the fact that yeah, I'm one of the original members of the team. And one of the interesting things is that whenever people discover from that team, they want to know which character played me in the movie. And I'm assuming that you're wondering that too. So, you know, I'll just let you know. I was a, I was this guy here. I was a coach. You know, so most people don't believe that. But yeah, you know, since then I went on a, a, a diet and got a tan. This is a new me, right? Um, you're still not buying that. I'm, I'm getting that sense. So <laughs> the truth is that the characters in the movie are really different from real life characters. So if I had to choose one, I'd say I'm Yul Brenner, the bald headed guy. Uh, played by Malik Yoba. The challenge is that a lot of people go, oh, so you were the mean one. And I agree that Malik did have an attitude in, in the movie. The guy was just frustrated. But you may also remember that he was a dreamer. He was the one that wanted to go to Buckingham Palace to live. And that's how I see myself as well, as a dreamer. So the next question people ask is, so Jamaica is smack in the middle of the Caribbean Sea, 90 miles from Cuba, it's a, a one-and-a-half flight up to Miami. How in the world does someone come up with the idea to start a boxer team in Jamaica? And I suppose you're wondering that too, huh? Well, the story is that two Americans who lived in Jamaica, George Fitch and William Maloney, they're in a local bar in Kingston, you know, imbibing some of the more potent sods we have on the island. You know, somebody mentioned rock earlier. And I wasn't there, but I have to believe they're also enjoying some of the aromas we have on the island. But, you know, I wasn't there, as I said. I don't want to cast any aspersion. They claimed they were drinking. And on this occasion, they were discussing the popular belief in Jamaica that Jamaican women and athletes were the best in the world. Well, there was no way for them to test the former without getting in trouble with their wives, so they decided to put the latter to the test. And if you've seen Cool Runners, you remember – Sanka Coffee racing this wooden cart down a winding mountain road. We actually do do that in Jamaica. We call it push cart derby. I've never done it myself because it's really dangerous and I just don't do dangerous things. But they saw it, thought it looked like bob selling except for the ice, uh, discovered that they need sprinters, and we have lots of sprinters in Jamaica. So they went to the guys on the summer team and they weren't interested. They were like, Bob who? Man, the only Bob we know in Jamaica is Bob Marley, Bob Marley, and he's dead. No, thank you. So they came to the Army looking for athletes. At the time, I was a young lieutenant in the Jamaica Defense Force. You know, and one of the interesting things I've noticed going around the states is that people are surprised that Jamaica had an Army. I'm like, how can you be surprised? Why do you think the United States have never even considered invading Jamaica? No? We have an Army, man, and we're some badasses. So... Yeah, I was. <laughs> uh, a young lieutenant and my colonel suggested that I tried out for the team. Now, in terms of my sporting background, actually, my first love was soccer, but my main sport ended up being track and field. But I wasn't a sprinter, as you would probably guess, growing up in Jamaica. That was one of the curses, you know. Everybody could sprint fast except me. So I was a middle-distance runner. I ran 800 and 1,500 meters. So how do you select a bobsled team in Jamaica is the next question. Well, interestingly, the same way all the major nations back then selected their teams. Yeah, it's kind of like the NFL combine. You had to sprint 30, 60, 100, 300 meters through a short put from between your legs, a standing broad jump, and what we call a push test with a makeshift sled. Basically, they're testing speed and explosive power. Now, as a middle distance runner, the only test that was comfortable for me was a 300 meter run because that's what I did for speed work. So I was, I felt a little bit like a fish out of water, but I tried and tried. And there, there were two guys from the American team who had come down to give us these tests. And I remember one of them saying to me, you had a good day today. And I was, you know, relieved. I excelled. I, I went back to the officer's mess. It was a Friday. I was so exhausted from two days of effort. I, I just fell asleep, slept through, through the entire night. The next morning I woke up and my friends are calling me the Olympian. Well, what happened? Well, apparently that night on the sports news, they announced that Jamaica had a boxer team. 
and I was one of the persons named on the team. So, of course, I'm excited, cautiously so. You know, I was optimistic, but I, I didn't get too excited because this was I was still in the Army, and I wasn't told anything officially. And then maybe two weeks later, I got an airline ticket, and they say, hey, you're going bobsledding. So I turn up at the airport, and I see three other guys who I recognize from the team trail. This is an early picture of the team. Obviously, the white guy is not one of the team members. That's George Fitch, one of the Americans who came up with the idea to start the team. Next to him is Michael White. Mikey was a private in the Army, the fastest guy on the team. Next to him is Samuel Clayton. Sammy was the only civilian on the team. He was an engineer with a railway company and unfortunately passed away this March, this past March from COVID. Um, and then that's me next to him, a lieutenant platoon commander, and Douglas Stokes was a helicopter pilot and uh, army captain. So we fly up to New York, um, drove up to, met George, drove up to Lake Placid, New York, which is about five hours from where I live now, where we met our coach, Howard Seiler. The other white guy you see pictured in, uh, here. Now, th this, this black thing you see between us, is, that's a two-man bobsled that Howard had in his driveway. And it's the first bobsled we are seeing in our lives. This is September 1987, by the way. Remember when the Olympics were? February 1988. And that's the first time we're seeing a bobsled. That's a, the, that weekend was the first time we saw a bobsled track. Um, the, the first time we were seeing, you know, a, an ice rink. In fact, the American team was there practicing their starts, and they invited us to practice with them. And, you know, what I call the Jamaican came out of us. You know, we strolled out on the ice and we go, hey, let's go beat them. And it did not happen. I mean, we spent more time on our butts than we spent pushing the sled. It was really difficult. And I was thinking to myself, wow, this bobsled thing is harder than I thought. But we kind of survived the weekend, returned to Jamaica to continue our preparations at the Jamaica Winter Olympic Sports Complex uh, pictured here. Um, that is what a winter's day looked like in Jamaica, just, just, just for your information. The thing that makes me chuckle, though, whenever I, I see this uh, picture, is the fact that every single thing we're doing in it is wrong. The position of the hands, the backs, the knees, the elbows, is all wrong. But that's what we thought we had learned from that one training session with the Americans, so that's what we did. But here's the the more important life lesson here for all of us. You should never, ever, ever wait until everything is perfect to go pursue your dreams because there will never be a perfect time. Yeah, there's something to be said about doing your research and, and so on, but if you sit there trying to wait until you have all your I's dotted and all your T's crosses, you will be crossed, you'll be waiting forever, right? You have to Really start from where you are with what you have, right? I like to tell people that, man, you have to jump off a cliff and learn to fly on your way down. That's the only way. I have competed in three Olympic Games. Our nation has competed in about eight now, and we started there doing every single thing wrong. So that's how we trained. Three hours every afternoon during the week, six hours on a Saturday morning, we would push this thing on, on, the, army, on the army basis, flat concrete surface. So eventually, October 8 to 7, mid-October, we went up to Calgary, and we went down a bobsled track for the first time. So now we are officially bobsledders, because this is not bobsledding by any stretch of the imagination. I uh, spent maybe six weeks in Calgary, went to Innsbruck, Austria, did one race against the B teams from some of the major nations, went home for Christmas, Went back to Lake Placid, New York, in January of 88, spent a month there, and then we went to the Olympic Games. That's it. That is the sum total of our bobsled knowledge and experience heading into Calgary. So uh, here we are in Calgary on the push track. And it may not be obvious to you, but we are so much better, so much improved in, in, the, in the short time. And another lesson, the, the thing about success, the thing we have to remember is most of what we need to succeed is skill-based. And what do we know about skills? 
There are things you learn, you practice them, you develop them, and eventually you get good. The truth is that when you start, you suck, right? Uh, that's, that just means that you're not very good, right? It's a technical, psychological term for incompetence. But if you work on it, you can get good and in a short period of time. And I'm going to demonstrate that to you in a minute. But here is something that's not in the movie. And if it were, I think people would just think that it's corny and just void of any possible truth. The guy in the blue, Chris Stokes, was not on the team at the start of the Olympic Games. He was on a track scholarship in Idaho. He came down to Calgary to watch his brother, Dudley, the driver, race. And it's the second week of the Olympic Games. And again, you know, what I call the Jamaicanness came out of us. And we go, hey, um, Chris, you're a sprinter, right? So we recruited him that week. Now, when I say the Jamaicanness came out of us, I'm being a little bit facetious. You know, what I mean is that you have to have the confidence. In fact, you have to have the brazen impudence. You have to have what my Hispanic friends would call the cojones to go pursue results, to go after dreams that everybody thought was impossible or just incredibly difficult. You just have to have that, man. And so we recruited Chris that week, that week of the four-man bobsled event, and in three days, we taught him everything we knew about pushing a sled. We only needed three days. We didn't know that much, right? But we taught him how to push a sled in three days, and at the end of the week, we had the seventh fastest start time. That's us there coming off the hill with the seventh fastest start time. And then you know how the story ends, don't you? <laughs> we crashed. Spectacularly, right? We, we failed. We failed, uh, I mean, tremendously. But let me give you a secret about bobsledding. The basic aim of the sport is to get from the top of the hill, cross the finish line, right side up. So when you do it the way we did it, on top of our heads, yes, that's a failure. That's a failure. Um, give me a, I, I, can you give me a thumbs up in the chat there if you've ever failed at anything? If you have ever failed, give me a thumbs up. And I'm kind of curious, though, how many of you ever failed and felt like a loser? Next question. How many of you have ever failed and felt like a loser on international TV? Well, my hand is still up. Uh, it happened, man, but here's the thing about failure. It isn't fatal. Failure isn't fatal, right? It's really an error in judgment. It's an opportunity to learn. The challenge is that most people, when they fail, they see themselves as a failure. And my challenge to you is to re refuse to see yourself as a failure. Yeah, you made a mistake. That's, those are the results. But now it's time for you to figure out what you need to do to get better. But I have to tell you that in the moment, it doesn't feel good. And, you know, so I just remember trying to exit stage left, trying to get off, uh, get away from the cameras as quickly as possible. I was walking down the breaking stretch. People just started to cheer. And sure, we love you. And I remember one guy reached over, to the, reached over the rails and shook my hand, and I was shaking every other hand until we got off. But, we, it, you know, in, in, the, in the moment, I just remember thinking, wow, how embarrassing and we had let down an entire nation. Like, that's a, like a heavy burden to be shouldered, right? You feel like the, the hoofs of an entire nation is on your shoulder. And so we're really worried about going home because we just failed in front of the world, uh, you know, representing a country that is so accustomed to excellence at the Olympic Games. And we thought they were going to ridicule us, but, wow, the response couldn't have been different. I mean, to the point where the government made stamps with our faces on it. And this was, you know, obviously way before text messages and emails and so on. And I remember I'd get a letter from a friend and on the envelope is a stamp with my face. I'm like, wow, what a handsome devil, you know. It's kind of cool. <laughs> but um, so that was Calgary, after Calgary. Uh, so in Calgary, I was the number two guy on that four-month sled. After Calgary, I became a driver. So here I am driving the sled, the two-man in uh, 1992, Alberville, 
and again in 98 in Nagano. And since my time on the bobsled slopes, I've you know, become a, a, a motivational speaker traveling around the world a little bit. Um, now I get to go around the world from my home. It's kind of cool how technology works, right? Um, I've written a couple of books, a children's book and a semi-autobiographical motivational book. Um, very involved in giving back to the truth. And so I've traveled around the country and a little bit overseas just uh, saying thanks uh, to the troops. Um, passionate about children's issues. So here I am as an, a, an athlete ambassador for Right to Play, so a group that uses um, sports and play to teach life skills, health skills, and conflict resolution to kids in refugee camps. And um, so this is me in uh, Sierra Leone, and if you have watched uh, Blood Diamond, it's an absolutely true story, it's harrowing, and a lot of these kids, they're orphans because, uh, you know, the country that was just ravaged by 10 years of civil war and HIV AIDS. And so, you know, the only time they get to become kids, quite frankly, is when they're in our program. Um, so, yeah, hanging out with them there. This is me at my old elementary school, back in the old neighborhood. Um, rather rough, impoverished, and many of the kids are going to school without breakfast. And so my foundation, the Keep On Pushing Foundation, uh, support a breakfast program at the school. We have fed over 6,000 kids in the last number of years. And we have a, a school supplies program as well at that school and about 10 other schools in the old neighborhood. And we're like almost putting the finishing touches on a, on a new building. This is a building here, it's a sick bay, we call it a place where kids who aren't feeling so well during the day can go hang out. And again, because it's such a challenging environment, it's a, it has a private room for the guidance counselor to be able to speak to some of the kids who may be having emotional issues. So, you know, th there are lots of themes and lessons that I think connect all of the slides I just shared with you. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you can see some kind of challenge in, in some of them. but. For me, the, the, the one that is most important, you know, the, is this philosophy of keep on pushing. Now, what's that, you might ask? Obviously, it has a bobsled analogy. That's how you start the race. You have to push the thing. But it's not one massive push, as you might think, right? It's actually a process. Because a sled, four-man sled, weighs over 650 pounds. So, yes, at the outset, you need a massive amount of energy to get it going, but if you should stop, theoretically, the step could come to a halt. So you have to keep on pushing because, remember, the goal is to get to maximum speed in as short a time as possible. And even as you're heading down the track, in a real way, you're still pushing against the ice conditions, the weather conditions, the twists and turns of the track. And you're also pushing against the limits of your own abilities. You're trying to do better than what you did previously. Right? Now, that, to me, sounds like the success journey of life, right? It's, it's an ever-changing dynamic process through which we evolve, through which we transform ourselves, we grow, and we also help the people and the organizations around us to grow. It also obviously speaks about uh, persistence, you know, finding a way to get over the obstacles that we may be facing in our lives. So, during the, next, during the remaining time I have, I want to share some thoughts with you, as I said earlier, on how you can keep on pushing during tough times. All of us collectively are dealing with this global pandemic and the uncertainty that is swirling around us because of this COVID-19 uh, virus, right? But surely we have had to deal with uh, other challenges in our lives as well, personally and collectively. And so... Uh, I want to share with you five ideas, my five P's, I'm calling it, and how you can push through tough times. And hopefully at the end we'll have uh, some time I can take some questions and we can continue the conversation that way. So if you're good with that, yeah, give me a thumbs up again. So the first, first P is perception. As human beings, our perception and their ramification are real. In fact, I would argue they are life-changing. And oftentimes, the thing that distinguishes you know, one person from another, one 
company from another is their perception of what is possible. And the challenge for all of us, I think, is to recognize that we have the ability to harness the power for perception. If I could choose a synonym for perception, it would be vision. We have the ability to harness the power for a vision personally, professionally, individually, collectively, as an organization uh, to steer our lives in the direction that we want it to go. So what's vision, you might ask? I call it a preferred future state. It's, 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 a, it's an image in your mind of a very different, far more dynamic, far more vibrant, far more you know, engaging future than what's here now. It's this clear alternate view of the world, this clear alternate view of your world and how different it would look once you have taken certain actions, once you have implemented certain changes. Now, I know that there are you know, any number of things in our lives that we have absolutely no control over, right? We, none of us have any control over the circumstances of our birth. You know, we didn't get to choose our parents or where we grew up. You know, we can't control what the government does. We have no control over how the market behaves. We certainly have no control over the fact that this pandemic is here with us. Now, if so, if, if we have all of these things happening in our lives that we have absolutely no control over, what does that mean for us? Does it mean that we are destined uh, to fate? I think you know the answer is no, right? You, we do have some control. What can you control? You can control the thoughts that you have, right? You can control the images that you visualize, and you can control as a result of those two, the actions that you take. So yes, you may not have control over the circumstances that, that you find yourself in, but you can control these things. So guess what happens? The circumstances that we have no control over is there, but you have your perception, right? How you perceive, how you receive, how you choose to look at the circumstances that you find yourself in, right? When you combine those two, you end up having the power to decide the outcome, as it were. Regardless of the circumstances, you can always visualize, you can always decide how to perceive your experiences, and that, my friends, help you to decide the outcomes that you experience. So I grew up in, in Kingston, um, a place called Olympic Gardens. If you've seen uh, those ads on TV come to Jamaica and feel all right. They weren't talking about my neighborhood at all, right? Um, Olympic Gardens is one of the toughest ghettos in the world, a shanty town characterized by broken down shacks set in a maze of dirt tracks and alleys. In fact, ooh, what happened here? Hmm. This is the house I grew up in. I'm not sure what happened to my clicker here just now. But this is a house I grew up in, um, in, in Olympic Gardens. And that's kind of what it looks like from the street. So as a teenager, when I was not in school, I was home. This lamppost was my favorite hangout spot. And I often ask my live audiences, what do you think I was doing there? And I'm, I'm not embarrassed to say I was doing the D word. And most people go, drugs? I'm like, no, man, I was dreaming. I was standing there. I was dreaming. I was visualizing, right? I was changing my perception of my environment because standing there, I had a really great view of forest hills, lined with big, beautiful mansions, right? Houses that would fit right into almost any affluent neighborhood in this country. I just had to look up, and I would see them. So I would just stand there, and I would dream. And I'm kind of wondering, you know, for you, if this was your situation, metaphorically speaking, right, you're going through a tough time, and when you look around your environment, when you contemplate your circumstances, there's nothing in it that suggests that there's a whale. There's nothing in your circumstances, in your surrounding, that would suggest that success is even remotely possible for you. I'm kind of wondering, how many of you could still stand by that lamppost 
and imagine this. You know, again, with my live audiences, not everybody put their hand up and I tell them that, hey, you know what, you are selling yourself short because each of us, each of us have the ability to become that which we aspire to be. And the only limitations, the only real limitations are the ones we impose on ourselves to the limits of our imagination. So, yeah, I stood there and I just kind of visualized, man, and less than a year after high school, I went from living here to living there. That's the Royal Military Academy in Sandhurst in England. It's the, so I go, I, I go from living in one of the worst ghettos in the world to the most prestigious military training school in the world. This is the British equivalent of West Point. Less than three years after high school, I go from running on a gravel strewn dirt track to creating history, sprinting on ice. So, um, I mean, I guess the moral of this story is that anything is possible. Regardless of your circumstances, know that you have the power to choose how you see your circumstances. You have the ability to imagine a different outcome and in the end, create a different outcome. So, hey, I want you, the, the, your strategy here is to spend some time visualizing and affirming the outcome that you would like. Uh, is something happening here? Let's see. I think I uh, let, get, yes, let, let me pause here. Let, I think I'm getting, am I getting uh, a message in the chat? I'm not sure. Yeah, oh, there's okay. a good okay. point. All right, all right, that's kind of okay. All right, yeah, thank you for that, Steve. Absolutely. <laughs> so I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm not losing uh, uh, anyone. So, uh, so the second P then is purpose, right? So perception, vision wants to know where are you going? Purpose wants to know why do you want to go there? Why do you exist? And it's not from a, you know, existential kind of, you know, what is the meaning, you know, what is the meaning of life kind of way. It is, hey, what significant contribution do you make to your team? What significant contribution does a team make to the company? What significant contribution is a company making to the community it serves, so its clients? And I know that you will probably say, well, you know, we offer uh, business, uh, you know, IT solutions to businesses. And, yeah, fair enough. Um, that's true, but understand that for you to connect with your purpose, you have to – here we go again – You have to elevate your thinking way beyond your job title and job function. That's, that, that's the only way you're going to connect with your purpose. You know, there's a, you may have heard it before, but I tell it again, the story of a, this passerby. He was going by this construction site and he saw three bricklayers. Asked the first guy, hey, what are you doing? And he says, oh, I'm laying bricks. It's a fair answer because that's what you do as a bricklayer. You lay bricks, right? The second guy says, Oh, I'm building a wall. Again, can't argue with that. If you lay enough bricks, you will build a wall. The third guy says, when asked the same question, I'm building a huge, magnificent cathedral to which people from all over the world can come and experience peace and serenity as they worship their God. Now, it's clear to me, I'm sure to you, that this third guy had identified his purpose. He recognized that what he was doing. It wasn't glamorous. Don't confuse glamour with importance, right? It wasn't glamorous. It was just a brick layer. But in laying those bricks, he was serving a purpose that was bigger than himself, that was outside of himself. And so as you were doing what you do, working together, you know, to get through these tough times, your challenge is to determine what your purpose is. You know, so maybe you are really optimizing um, uh, costs. Maybe you're enhancing the, the cybersecurity or you're improving data storage performance. That is the vehicle by which you serve a bigger purpose. 
it's not what you do in itself, but what you, but but how you use what you do to make an impact in the world. The singer is using up a little bit, right? So that's why you have to be thinking about how am I going to impact the world? And I get it that you know usually when you start out, you're not thinking about how you're going to save the world, how you're going to change the world. I promise you, when I was standing at that lamppost. I was not thinking about how I was going to change the world. I was thinking about how I was going to change my world. But I think all of us, individually and collectively, as we create that vision, as we visualize a different outcome, we start to make progress. In my humble opinion, we have an obligation. The onus is on us to now start figuring out uh, start doing this deeper dive, start figuring out who we truly are on the inside and how we're going to um, use our skills and knowledge and experience and so on to make a difference, to create solutions that is going to make a difference in the lives of other people. And it doesn't have to be something huge. It doesn't have to be, right? It could be, I know that like every Thanksgiving, you guys give a free turkey. That's you're putting a smile on somebody's face, man. It's just, it could be something as simple as that, right? It could be, hey, writing a thank you note, writing a, a note of gratitude anonymously to somebody on the team. And so, you know, I, I, I suggest all the time to clients, you may have a, a suggestion box, create a thank you box, and have people just write anonymous notes to other people. It will lighten up their, their face. It will, it will make their day. Each of us have that responsibility, you know. Um, this author says that human beings by their very nature seek purpose. They seek a cause that is more enduring and far more important than themselves. And I think us being able to identify our purpose is one of the most enduring things we could ever do individually and collectively as well. So your strategy, your job is to think of how you, as an individual and collectively as a team, would want to make an impact using what you do now. Number three, personal leadership. You know, le leadership is such a broad and very topic. We could spend the entire afternoon speaking about leadership. Um, but what I want to say first is recognize that regardless of your, your role, your job title, how long you've been with the company, regardless of all of that, know that every single one of you is a leader. Because when you strip it down to the very basics, leadership is influence. That's it, influence. And every single day, you're influencing someone else. If you're interacting with a couple of colleagues, you're leading because you're influencing. If you're working with a client, you're leading because you're influencing. And that's important work. Not just because that's how you make a living, and that's important, but because you bring purpose and value to people's lives when you, when you influence them in a positive way. Now, the best leaders, the most effective leaders in the world, I'll say the most effective individuals in the world, Recognize that their number one responsibility is their own discipline and personal growth. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about personal leadership. You see, as, a, as an army guy, I'm trained that leadership is about follow me. I'm leading from the front. But personal leadership is about leading from the inside out because everything that happens in here eventually makes its way out into the real world. And so if you want to be uh, an effective teammate, an effective husband, wife, spouse, son, daughter, friend, you have to embark on this thing called personal growth and discipline, right? Because this just, there's just no way you can give what you don't have. How can you expect to encourage or challenge someone to be their best if you yourself have no clue about what it means, what it feels like, to push past their perceived limitations. How can you give value to someone? Bring, how can you bring value to them if you are yourself another person of value? It's not possible, right? So you have to, to uh, 
commit, which is what self-leadership is, our personal leadership, is about committing to a lifetime of growth. It's about committing, right? Bruce Lee says the function and duty of a quality human being is a sincere and honest development of one's potential. So it behooves all of us to be constantly working and getting better, acquiring new skills, because there's really no substitution for that, for learning more about yourself, for learning new skills, of, you know, acquiring knowledge and doing the consistent work to get as close to your full potential as possible. And so my suggestion is that we embody the spirit of the Olympic athlete. If you're a fan of the Olympics, you recognize these words, Sightius, Altius, Fortius. It's the Olympic motto, swifter, higher, stronger. And it speaks to the athlete's spirit and mind and body, always striving to achieve a standard higher than the one before. Just as I said earlier, when we're in the box and we're going down the track, we're always trying to do better than what we did before, right? We're always pushing ourselves and pushing the envelope, trying to get better. That's, what, that's the spirit of the Olympic athlete, and that's my challenge to you because we're living in a world that is changing so rapidly, right? You have to become a learning organization, not just as a company, not just as a team, but as individuals as well. You have to, you know, just recognize that if I'm going to stay relevant, if I'm going to thrive, if I'm going to uh, put myself in a position to effectively, if, you know, and efficiently get through the most challenging times in my life, I have to sharpen my skills. I have to, you have to sharpen your skills. That's the only way, which means embracing change, right? Change is coming at you from a hundred different directions. Some of the change you are, you are creating yourself, but most of it is coming at you. And the only way, again, you're going to be prepared is if you have that mindset that says, hey, swifter, stronger, faster, right? I know that in the last months you have been dealing with change through the ERP system, you know, this new uh, system of how you're ordering and shipping and reporting uh, your, your, your orders, and it's driving some of you crazy, I know. But I think if you uh, embrace this idea that, look, you know, it's part of the process, um, you know, life is painful. I know I'm a motivational speaker. I'm supposed to give you a warm and fuzzy message. I know, I'm sorry. Life is full of pain at times, right? You are going to have to deal with the pain of change or the pain of regret. So whether it's change that is being forced upon you or change that you are creating because you're trying to grow, that's going to create, it's going to be painful. And so you have to either deal with the pain of change or the pain of regret. Just know that the pain of change is temporary. You learn it like, you know, I, I, I'm from Jamaica. It's 96 degrees in the shade, and I go Bob saying where it's minus 40 degrees, and that's painful. But guess what? I'm a three-time Olympian, three-time Winter Olympian, right? I am not spending the rest of my life wondering in regret what could have happened had I tried out for the team, right? So the strategy here is to identify one area personally, one area as a team, one area as a company that you like to improve. I know when you make the evaluation, you see 10 different things and you want to tackle them all at once. No, one. Find one and work on it, improve on it. You will grow exponentially. Number four uh, is people, the fourth P. Uh, because, look, you know, our success begins with us. There, there's, like, no, no way around that, right? Each of us, we are responsible uh, for our own success, right? And we we'll work on that. We visualize it. We put the effort in. But we also know, though, that no one, and I mean no one, succeed by themselves. Each of us needs all of us. One person doesn't make an economy. One person doesn't make a company. One person doesn't make a team. We need all hands on, on deck uh, to get it done. Um, one of the surprising things about me, I guess, is that I, and I'm Jamaican, but I listen to country music. <laughs> I have to assume that it must be a weird sight to see 
a Jamaican bobsled driving around New York listening to country music, but that's me. And um, there's a, oh, I forgot his name now, but he has a song with the words, um, I, I don't ask much for help. If I need a mountain move, I move it myself. And, and I th thought to myself, wow, what an independent spirit. The guy just is a go-getter. But I also thought to myself, you know, he probably needs to hear my talk and, and you know, and, you know, engaging other people, uh, you know, working as a team because you are able to get so much done, man. Our lives are forged by many hearts and hands. We need, as I said earlier, all hands on deck in order to accom truly accomplish our goals, right? Because the truth is that no matter how you look at it, which feel you're in, how amazing your ideas are, how genius your marketing plan is, don't be fooled. Success is a team sport. You need other people. You need teammates. You need partners to help you to get it done. Those who are inside the company as teammates and the partners that you call clients, customers, you cannot succeed without any of them. I think most companies or perhaps too many companies have it wrong. They think that their number one purpose is to raise market share, right? And that's an important part, right? Because um, you're in business to make money. But your number one purpose really is to take care of the people that, that, are, that are on your team internally and externally because people grow, they get better, right? Machines uh, break down, buildings fall into disrepair, um, systems become antiquated, but people, they grow and they can help you to get better. So we have to remember that they are your greatest assets. The people on the team are the greatest assets. You could be going through the toughest of times and the company gets wiped out, wiped out but if you have the people, you can always build because they are the real engines of progress. They are the ones that help you to grow. And as you go through changes, whether they are changes that you created or that are being forced upon you, it's the people, the customers, the internal customers and the external ones. They are the ones who are going to be impacted the most by the changes, and they are the ones who are going to have the greatest impact. They are the ones who are going to make sure that whatever changes come down the pipeline actually work. And so that's where you kind of need to be investing your time uh, you know, I consider myself a lone ranger at times, but I also recognize that my greatest accomplishments have come because I've worked with other people. Human beings push and they inspire each other uh, to go further. So find an accountability partner. Find somebody who you can work with, who can keep you on track to help you going forward. And finally, persistence. It's perhaps my favorite of the P's um, because, you know, you can start out with this amazing vision and, um, you know, identify your purpose and you're working with others and working to grow. But let's face it, you're going to meet up on some tough times, as we all are now. And the people who succeed in most cases aren't the most talented, aren't the greatest visionaries, are the ones who persist, are the ones who hang in there, the ones who, who found a way to keep on pushing. And the thing we have to understand is that our dreams are going to be tested. Life will, without apology, test your commitment to the vision that you created. And your ability to persist, your ability to keep on pushing, to kind of just hang in there, even when it seems hopeless, that's your answer, man, to life. I'm here and I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to hang in here until it's done, right? You have to develop the ability to endure in the face of all difficulties. You know, I tell the story of uh, my third Olympics. You know, so people would think that um, Calgary 88 was the most difficult of, of my three Olympics because it was the first time. Not by a long shot. Uh, 1998, going back to my third Olympic Games, was the most difficult. I remember being in, in, in Calgary, January 1997, 
And the coach says to me, you know, Devon, if you don't get sponsorship by June, you should quit. You'll be chasing pipe dreams, he says to me. I agreed with him only because I was so sure June would come, I'd have my sponsorship, and the whole conversation would have been moot. It would have been irrelevant, quite frankly. Well, <laughs> June came, and I had no sponsorship. By now, I'm in Evanston, Wyoming, about 50 miles outside of Salt Lake City, I'm training eight hours a day, and I'm delivering pizzas at night. I'm doing whatever it takes to keep the dream alive. Now, earlier I spoke about the fact that you have to get started from where you are. Well, wherever you, it is that you find yourself, if you hope to get to where you want to be, you have to find a way to keep the dream alive. And so I'm training myself, I'm coaching myself, delivering pizzas eight hours a day, training eight hours a day, delivering pizzas at night. My right knee is swollen one and a half times the size of a torn meniscus and I have still now arthritic knees. <laughs> and I would go to the track in the morning and I'm warming up and I'm working my way through the pain on the first lap and I'm singing up to myself. I won't sing for you. I've spoiled this whole thing. But I'm singing, I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. And I'm working my way through the pain on the second lap and I'm singing, if I can see it, then I can be it. If I just believe it, there's nothing to it. You know, July, August, September came, no sponsorship. I'm still believing, but I'm telling you, man, I'm frustrated as hell. October, November, December came, no sponsorship. I did not get sponsored until January 1998, weeks before it was time to go to the Olympics. But I'm a three-time Olympian in part because I didn't quit. I found a way, as difficult as it was, to endure. And all of us have that ability as well, to just put one foot in front of the other. Man, when I was younger and more sprightly and I would go for those runs, I would be heading back home to that little shack I showed you earlier, and I would be so exhausted, and I, my mantra was, one foot in front of the other. And I'm telling you, if you figure a way to do that during your tough times, I'm not saying it's going to be easy, it's going to be painful, it's going to be tedious, it's going to be frustrating, but if you just figure a way to put one foot in front of the other, you'll eventually get there. The amazing thing about persistence is this, right? There's a strong correlation and connection to courage and confidence, right? You need courage. Only courageous people go after crazy dreams, right? Only courageous people dare to see, uh, uh, you know, their circumstances a little bit differently in order to create a different outcome. But only a person who is confident would persist because if you didn't think you had it in you to get it done, you would quit. Why would you continue? You would quit. But here's the thing. The more confident you are in your abilities, the more you persist. And the more you persist, the more confident you become. And when you have the reputation, when people will say, you know, if she says she's going to do it, it's money in the bank. If she, he says it's going to be done, if that company says they're going to do it, you can believe it. When you have that reputation, your success is virtually guaranteed. So that's my challenge to you. Don't quit. Instead, become consumed by your vision. Because, you know, when it gets really tough and you close your eyes and you can picture that outcome, there's no power on earth, I believe, that will stop you. So those are the thoughts, you know. Have a, have, you know, change your perception, connect with your, your purpose, uh, you know, practice personal leadership, work with people, and persist. If you can do that, well, can't promise you'll be a Jamaican boxer. The accent is a little bit difficult to get, but you'll definitely become an Olympian in life.